Hello, I'm Shruti and I'm back with yet another episode of My Second Nature. And what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to be conversing with another author. Aapko yaad hai pichli baar maine kaha tha that it's really important that we get behind the scenes and understand ke jitne authors hote hain, writers hain, audio series jo create karte hain, series banate hain, uh, audio books likhte hain, audio books present karte hain, all these things. What goes behind making this and how does the whole process happen and kya hota kya hai matlab, you know, what is behind the scenes of all of this. So today we're going to be talking to the author of Welcome to the Zoo, Mishana Khot. Hi Mishana, how are you today? Hi. Hi Shruti, it is so good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. Oh, it's super fun. I'm glad you agreed because like, <laughs> you're like four books down, like fancy author, like, you know, <laughs> listen, I must, okay, first for, for everybody who's watching us right now, I must tell you this, four books she's already released. The first one was Brave Day for Harold Brown. Second was Merry Christmas, Mr. Brown. Third which we just, we, today, what we're going to talk about and the one that we're also going to read a nice little excerpt of a book read for you guys together, we're going to do. That's called Welcome to the Zoo. That's this one. And the one that's released latest, latest. When did it release? A uh, couple of months ago, actually. Just the end of 2021. Oh, wow. What a way to end the year. Yeah. That was yeah. the <laughs> traveling zoo, right? That was the traveling that's zoo. That's right. So yes. let's first get started. Let's begin to get to know you first, right? What sparked yeah. this interest in you to be a writer? Like what happened in your life where you said, let me just pause everything else and let me take writing seriously and just like invoke the gene code within me. What happened? <laughs> um, I don't think there was any like a specific moment. I've, I've known I wanted to write books since I was nine years old. Like I used to write stories in the back of my school books um, and read them out to my siblings. And uh, I, I thought that at some point, I always knew I would write a book. Um, I think it took me until my 20s to feel like, you know, now my uh, abilities were good enough to maybe think about publishing. I right. had a ton of books before that, but obviously none of them were good enough for publishing. But you um, wrote, but you my, wrote full-on books before that. I wrote full-on books. Yes, absolutely. I filled up wow. like my school books with stories about cats and dogs and space travel and whatnot. So, oh, but none wow. of them were like, obviously you know, good enough. And then finally, in my, I think in my, in my thirties, I decided now enough of all these jobs and all that. Um, it's time for me to do what I dreamed about doing since I was a little kid. And I started writing the first book and uh, that came out about six, six years ago. Yeah, the first and one. and uh, how, how long did it take you to write your first book though? Um, it's a, it's a bit of a work in progress. So I stop and start, like I it took me about a year, but I was, and it's like, it's, it's really a short book, but, um, you stop and you get stuck and it's the first book. So you're very scared about, you know, when you get stuck, you think maybe you don't have the skills you need as a writer. Right. Um, so I would take a break for a couple of months and I was also doing freelance projects, writing work, you know, traveling, a whole bunch of distractions. Okay. And, uh, you know, so it was, it took a year, but maybe writing time was probably about three months uh, for that book. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, okay. So uh, right off the bat, I'm seeing a pattern here. Because the four books that I spoke about right now, the ones that have released, right. the first two are about Harold Brown and Mr. Brown. So yeah. first, who is this Mr. Brown? And second, what is your fascination with this dual, dual thing? Because then the zoo <laughs> books are also like two. So first tell me who is Harold Brown? I'm very inquisitive now. So, Harold Brown is um, a complete figment of my imagination. He is not based on anyone. He's just um, I always find it very fascinating. Uh, like I'm a quiet person myself. I'm very reclusive. I'm not very good in social gatherings, um, you know, like in big parties and all that. So, and I'm always drawn to the quieter people, you know, the ones who are standing on the, in the corner because I feel like I can relate to that shyness or that uh, awkwardness in, uh, in society. Um, and I find that shy people listen a lot more than, you know, the noisy people. Um, <laughs> But I, having said that, like noisy people have a special place in my heart because it cuts down on the amount of conversation that I have to make. So if I'm with someone who likes to talk a lot, um, the pressure on me is a lot less. <laughs> I, I enjoy that as well. Interesting. Um, but Harold Brown is, he was interesting for me because um, he's almost, he's 50 years old. He lived his whole life alone with his cat. He's got a nice little routine and, you know, um, he's living in this quiet little village town almost. 
and something big happens to him um, to change his life completely and to turn him into a different turn him onto a different path in his life right. and uh, you know a quiet person finding the guts and the courage to um, to step forward into that new path and say you know what i'm i've never done anything like this in my life before but um, i know that i have it within me to go forth and conquer this challenge that is there um, mm-hmm. ahead of me and i think that's that's what excited me um, quite a bit about harold obviously i like the fact that he has a cat and his cat is his best friend um so that's that's something special to me as but well but that's that's really interesting because you know normally when they say that the first books are always they're coming from a person and their experience now here you're clearly not i mean i don't know how many years back the book came but uh, you were clearly not a 50 plus year old man <laughs> no. so so while that one thread is common where you're saying you know that you're an introvert or you're a shy person and who likes to uh, usually you know recede to the corners so that's a common bit but to to fit into the experience of a 50 plus year old man how did you do that or what did you think about how did you gather on those little bits of experience uh, to be able to put into a book um i think i think as a writer you know you're you're always observing you're looking at people like even if i go for a jog in the morning i'm looking at people and you're always thinking what is their story what is their back story you know you see them um in a party or on the train or at work you see someone and there's something about them that is you know you just see them in a little window of their life but then you you kind of imagine the whole back story of theirs so observation um i think is what led to understanding what harry brown goes through right. um i did spend a lot of time looking at pictures of uh, you know old men in tweed coats oh. uh, you know old men in park benches like just to just to get myself in that mental space every day when you go back because you know some days you you sit at the laptop and um, you're in a different mood than you were yesterday so maybe today i'm in a quiet mood i'm in a contemplative mood i'm thinking you know a uh, calm down but maybe the next morning i've just done a great workout and i'm feeling all peppy and lively and i can't go and write harold brown in that mood so you have to settle down and you know uh, this thing so i think as a as a writer you have to be able to put yourself in different shoes of different people yeah. and um, I was really hoping that the Harold Brown experiment paid off because you know obviously it's it's completely different from my own experience. This sounds very interesting. I think most definitely th- that's going to be a, the next book of yours that I'm going to go buy and read because <laughs> like this is very interesting to know how you know the process behind how you came up with the character and how you stuck to and created that story which is very interesting. But today we're going to talk about your new book. So, yes. latest book is traveling zoo its second part which brings me to that whole dual part thing is it intentional that you're coming up with these dual dual part 1 part 2 books or is it just happening um, by chance the so i think that harold brown was only meant to be one book but uh, it did really well and um, i had like rev- uh, reviews from readers around the world all different ages saying you know we want to know more about him it's a very short book it's, it's 45 pages long wow. um so and like 10 10 12 chapters so people started saying no we like we need to know more about him we want to know you know what he does after this big thing that happens in the book um so i started thinking about it and i was still quite attached to harold um i think you know um i don't believe in stretching a book for longer then if the story this if the story ends at 12 chapters then i end it over there because the reader knows when the writer is trying to fluff out the content you know um, that's very meticulous but, of her because i know many people who will just stretch it out just because <laughs> that's well done ha huh, okay um, it is it is good for business if you stretch it out like it is good for you know making money but right. um, you know as a writer you're not supposed to be Correct. looking at all that you're supposed to create a good story and a good character and a nice tight story and um, that's, that's that's what it. i was focusing on yeah, yeah. but um, harold brown i still felt maybe there was a little bit more that uh, i needed to add to end his story in a way that you know readers would feel um, satisfied and it just so happened that i decided that i would write it in time for christmas because you know books are a great christmas gift like i love getting books as gifts um so i started writing it and i decided i'd do a christmas theme for him because you know there's there's so much um there's so much emotion and so much love and so much goodwill in the air around christmas time Correct. um so i wanted that all to channel into the book and you know to make it uh, like a really happy ending so that that worked out into two books um for the zoo series uh, the first one was just uh, as i mean i thought i'd put it together and see how it did in the market 
and uh, it was shocking to me that so many people wrote back and said like you can't stop it here you have to write the next one <laughs> and i had a lot of stories like when i wrote the first book i had to trim it down a lot just to put the best stories that i thought would work for one book Right. but i had so much material uh, anyway that i had written so i took those i reworked all of them I, there's a theme for the second book it's a travel theme for these four characters so i i pulled up you know old stories from my childhood that were travel related and uh, i put it together but um, the zoo series not it's not going to be two i'm i'm working on a third one as well um so that that will hopefully be the last one <laughs> yeah. nice. last one in the series the right. zoo series so right that, that um, the, the dual thing is not deliberate ah okay yeah it's <laughs> going to be a dual and now a trilogy and then let's see what yes. follows oh let's lovely see. Let's lovely see <laughs> so now of course uh, uh, before we go any further i think it's only fair that we do a little book read and we get into the story of welcome to the zoo which is part 1 as to who are these four people what is happening in their life what is going on uh, i love I, i have read the book so i do know that each story is different from each other which is what is really nice about this book because you know uh, there are days when i have and i have i i must tell you this there are days when i have just been feeling a little out of it and i've picked up your book and i've just randomly opened on to one page and then picked that story and read it and it's never it's it's always put a smile on my face it's never failed to put a smile on my face literally like and i've just been like ear to ear smiling i've forgotten whatever my issue was and i've just been laughing with glee remembering my own childhood and just going with the flow of yours so i have so many questions but we're going to get into that after this read ready for it sure done let's Super. go let's go let's do what's going to be the most interesting part is that we're going to book read this together and i don't know everyone who's ever done it like that so we're just trying something let's see how it goes ready mashana are we good to ready. go ready already awesome yes. so <laughs> welcome to the zoo is the book we're reading out chapter 6 for you so if you're wondering where to go buy it the description is in the i mean the link is in the description go there click it but this is one chapter from the book from part 1 which is called welcome to the zoo welcome to the zoo chapter 6 Fairies in the treehouse. Baby, wake up! Wake up! I rolled over in my blankets, mumbling into the night. We had gone to bed hours ago, and I couldn't imagine why Daddy was waking me up now. Surely it wasn't time for school yet. Wake up! The fairies are here. They're in your treehouse. I sat bolt upright in my bed, wide awake. The room was dark, except for the red glow of our nightlight. Daddy stood outside the mosquito net in his dressing gown with the newspaper still in his hand. Aji was fast asleep in her room next to us and Izzy snored in the top bunk of the bunk bed. Are you sure daddy? What do you mean? He sputtered. Of course I'm sure. I just heard them. Get the smallies and come out quick or else we'll miss them. And with that daddy turned and disappeared. I fumbled around for Kuku and Ritu. Kuku slept next to me, and every night she managed to rotate in bed, waking up in the morning with her feet on the pillow. I found Kuku's ankle and shook her awake, then rummaged through the mosquito net to wake up Ritu. We had the bunk bed complete with ladder lined up beside our double bed. Ritu slept in the lower bunk and Izzy slept on top. Daddy slept on the far edge of the double bed to protect us from ghosts and from falling off the edge. The fairies are having a party in the tree house. I hissed. Ritu woke up quickly and thumped her palm under Izzy's bunk to wake him up. He stopped snoring immediately. Always a light but noisy sleeper, and all of us tumbled out of bed. Daddy made sure we had our slippers and sweaters on before leading us out into the dark garden. Rum and Raisin wagged their tails and raced up to greet us, puzzled but thrilled to be reunited with us at this hour of the night. From behind them emerged. from the pile of gunny sacks they slept in our four puppies gambled up looking for snacks eclipse unfurled from the shadows that completely camouflaged his black fur and stalked up to see what was happening all of us spent a few seconds calming our clan don't make any noise you hear the fairies are very shy creatures and they'll fly away if they even suspect we're watching them daddy looked at us in the moonlight trying to make sure we understood he shot a pointed look at kuku 
liable to squeal in her excitement, and she nodded obediently, saucer-eyed with anticipation. Okay, come on then, and don't trip on the dogs like last time. Daddy led the way around the side of the house. We walked under the row of coconut trees on soft feet. Daddy first, with a restraining hand on Izzy's shoulder. Ritu and Kuku walked with each other, with a cat cradled on Ritu's shoulder. I followed, bringing up the rear, while Rum and Raisin ran in circles around us, shepherding us without knowing where we were headed. It was a chilly night and the moon was full. The moonlight burnished the trunks of the coconut trees and cast a silvery glow over the garden. Our Rad Ki Rani bush was sprinkled with thousands of white blossoms that sent an intoxicating sweet fragrance into the crisp air. The crickets filled the night with their strange music. It was the perfect night for a fairy tea party. Daddy stopped at the corner and raised a hand to tell us to wait. Kuku and Ritu missed the signal, bumped into Daddy and stopped. We waited, straining to see fairies in the darkness or to hear their tinkling voices. But all we heard were the crickets. You must have made too much noise. Admonished Daddy. He crept closer to the treehouse, followed by us. Izzy doing his best pink panther walk on his toes and all of us following suit. When we reached the Chiku tree, it was silent. We looked around expectantly for a few minutes and then turned to Daddy, downcast. There was no glow from magical fairy wings, no glitter sprinkling down into our faces and no new fairy friends to make. Come here, Mahi. Dad said. We must have just missed them. Look inside the treehouse and see if they left anything. I put the puppies down and he hoisted me up on his shoulders. The treehouse was about six feet high and we usually climbed the tree to get into it. But daddy lifted me up so I could grab the railings and pull myself over the ledge of it to look inside. Daddy, there's food here. I was astonished. What? What food? It's fairy food. No. Don't be silly. The fairies wouldn't leave any clues behind like that. The four of you must have left it there today. I told you not to eat anything up there or the ants will start visiting every day. No, daddy, no, no. We didn't even come up here today. It's fairy food. Look. I held up the remnants of a cupcake that I know we hadn't eaten. By now, the smallies were hopping from one leg to the other with excitement. Izzy pulled himself free from daddy's hand and tore up the tree climbing like a monkey into the treehouse. Daddy hoisted Cuckoo and Ritu up and I pulled them over. Look, Daddy, look, a bit of bread. Daddy, Daddy, a half-eaten banana. Daddy, how come we always miss them? I want to see them so bad. Well, all of you take so much time to get ready and you make so much noise. I could hear them from all the way inside the house before I woke you up. They must have flown away just seconds before you arrived. Next time, we'll have to be faster and quieter. We spent half an hour there, talking down from the treehouse to Daddy, who stood in the moonlight in his blue dressing gown, arms akimbo, laughing up at us. Finally, it was time to go back to our warm beds and blankets, and we promised ourselves we would be on time to see them next time. In the year after, we lost our mother. The four of us had frequent nightmares for many months. After waking up crying or being woken up by whoever was having a bad dream, we dreaded bedtime. Daddy tried reading to us till we fell asleep, keeping a night lamp on, and stayed awake long into the night to keep an eye on us. But the nightmares didn't stop, and we made endless requests for another glass of water or one last trip to the toilet. And so, Daddy devised all kinds of exciting and magical plans for our nights, giving us something fun to look forward to when we drifted off to the land of Nod. Long after we had brushed our teeth and gone to sleep, he would throw open the mosquito net and declare a midnight ice cream party, where we scrambled up and rubbed the sleep from our eyes. We devoured bowls of ice cream in bed, serving second helpings and giggling at silly jokes, before going back to sleep without brushing our teeth. It was our biggest thrill and the ice cream always tasted better at midnight. When the fairy tea parties started taking place in our tree house, the four of us were delirious with excitement. We often asked daddy if today was the day, but the parties only took place when the moon was full. Somehow, 
we were always too late to catch the fairies at their party, but we always found bits of food they left behind. Listen, reading this with you, I am reliving my childhood. This is fantastic. <laughs> it is so much fun. I'm so glad. This is the first time I've done this. It's amazing. This is super fun. Was right? I okay? Was I good? Like the expressions were good? Yes, yes, yes. I loved it. You could totally be a voice actor. Don't take away my job <laughs> along with being a writer. <laughs> no, no. Now you have to tell me, is this actually your childhood? Did this actually happen? Or how, how, how much of it is your imagination? And how much of it is like real? The, that's a question that almost everyone asks me, <laughs> and especially kids, because kids today think like there's no way that, you know, these kids' parents would allow them to get away with some of the stuff they do <laughs> because my parents would never let me do that. So they yeah. asked me, then the, this, this one couldn't have happened. Like this story, come on, you've made it up. But yeah. the, the fact is every story in Welcome to the Zoo has actually happened. Um, exa almost exactly, almost word to word of how it was. Um, obviously, I put a little tarka in it, and I, yeah. you know, it painted the picture of where we are and set the story in a certain season or a certain place. So that um, that changes a little bit, but that's uh, for the reader's benefit. But right. the events of the stories have happened exactly like that. Like that, we were horrible kids, and <laughs> uh, we did do all these mischievous pranks exactly as they were. That's amazing. I mean, that's the kind of childhood one needs to have. But, uh, you know, if I really think about my childhood, there were many events that happened. I remember the main, main event. I remember how it played out and basically in my emotional state, what I felt about it. But when you're yeah. writing today and you're thinking back of your childhood and putting it into a story, um, you don't just need the child's perspective, right? You need yeah. what the child felt. But more importantly, the overall flow of the story, how each child felt. So how did you manage to do that? Did you chat with all your siblings and your father <laughs> and said, okay, now I need to know? Or did you just in your head, whatever your perception at that point was of their feelings? How did you do? Basically, just unfurl the whole thing for me. How did you go about <laughs> this whole process? So, um, we, so I wrote this book during the first lockdown, the first year of the pandemic. Um, so everyone was working from home and everyone was doing Zoom calls and, you know, connecting with each other. And um, I decided at that point that, you know, we everyone needed something that was happy and uh, optimistic and, you know, made you feel like the world still has joy in it. Because the first lockdown was difficult for, I think, all of us, you know, yeah. there was a lot of, lot of challenges. Um, so one of the things that I decided was the book is going to be really upbeat and really happy and you know like and I wanted it to be um, relatable for any age so whether you're a nine-year-old reading it um, most of my audience is like uh, either nine to 14 and then straight away it's like my age and above like you know people who look back and say oh my god my childhood was like this you know back yeah. in the 80s and 90s yeah. um, so it had to it has to appeal to two different types of people two different ages of readers um, so I did need help remembering some of the uh, events. So I would have calls with my siblings. We would get on these Zoom calls and I had a list of the questions of the events that I wanted to write about. And then we would just discuss them. It would be like a very free flowing um, discussion. Everyone's laughing and pointing fingers at each other and saying, no, no, this was your fault. No, you did this. So we did that uh, quite a bit. Um, and after multiple phone calls, I had like pages and pages of notes that I had been scribbling down during the calls. Wow. And after that, it's just about sitting and, you know, um, melting it all together into yeah. a, into one experience. I didn't talk to my dad about this because he hopefully has forgiven us for a lot of the things that we have done. Um, <laughs> and I wanted it to be from the kid's point of view, you know, not correct. from the parent's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And that comes across entirely because the book yeah. truly has captured the essence of what a child goes through and what is going through their head so completely yeah. that, which is why I think it's so relatable, at least like you said, that the other age group, which is thinking back of their childhood with this. I yeah. think that's yeah. why, and I fall in that. So I completely <laughs> connected and you're so right about that. So does that happen yeah. to you? Like do people like walk up in parties to you and say, oh, I love that story or I did this. Or like whatever, and yeah. do they start telling about their stories to you? Do you go through that? So much, so <laughs> much, yeah, a lot. And so many of them, especially people who've grown up uh, before the, you know, the internet yeah. and, uh, you know, phone call, like Zoom calls and all that. Like so in the 90s, 2000s, if you've grown up in a small town, 
um, you've had like, you know, a garden or a bungalow or like, you know, you've been able to cycle freely up and down between your friends' houses or cycle to school. So a lot of those um, small town 90s India um, uh, memories are very special to all of us because that world has almost, you know, disappeared right now. Yes. Um, so I think people who read that, they come and they, they want to talk about what they've done and what, what kind of antics they've gotten up to as kids. And um, or just to say that, you know, this this book, put me in a very happy space and reminded me of my siblings or my family. Right. Uh, a, a couple of readers have said I started talking to my siblings more after that because wow. I realized, you know, what a bond uh, siblings share. Like, you know, if you're close and you tend, you tend to forget that as you move on and you grow older. Right. Um, so I started talking about like a lot of our old memories. That, that, was, that was nice uh, to hear that, you know, That's my book huge. did that. Yeah, that's huge. I was just about to ask you that have people come up to you and shared stories, any such interesting story and here you are already telling me different <laughs> ways the way, you know, they were fed. Wow, that's fantastic. So what's next? You've already told me that there is book three now that's coming, right? There yes, is a whole, yes. there's a book three. And so how book one was about the childhood and about different incidents. Book two, you said is traveling. What is book three about? Yes. Can we get like a sneak peek not... already or not yet? Like... <laughs> I haven't decided the theme yet. I'm just right. putting down the story still. Um, I want it to be the, the end of the zoo uh, tr trilogy um, <clears throat> because Welcome to the Zoo is set, uh, each book is set one year uh, uh, later. Right. So the kids get one year older, you know, they've changed, things are different a little bit for them in their, um, in their worldview. Right. Um, so, and I don't want the kids to, you know, age out in the books. I want them to remain at this, Children, know, this age yeah. for the readers to always remember them, you know, no oh, one's wow. interested in reading about their hostel or teenage life or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, I want them to stay frozen in time in the books. Um, so I haven't decided what the theme is yet. I think I will, the first book was set all at home in Belgaum, where I come from. Um, the second book travels to different locations around India, around the world, summer right. holidays and yeah. Diwali holidays. Um, I think for the third book, because so many people liked Belgaum as a setting and, you know, the house and my grandmother and the people who are uh, a part of our lives in our house, um, as well as all our pets. We have a huge yes. uh, collection of pets in the first book. So I, the travel stories kind of took the four children out of that setting. Right. Um, I think for the third book, I'm going to put them back over there and have different stories in the same setting because people really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed writing uh, in that setting a lot more. Correct. Um, so most most likely it will be back in Belgaum. That's end. very exciting. And I'm sure all your readers who've already read both the books are going to be super excited with this news. And yeah. you get to know yeah, that this is actually getting, happening. Yeah. I'm getting uh, nagged by little children who are calling up and saying like, when is the next one out? I finished part two now. Like, let, let's get like, the third book out already. Oh, what's lovely, next? Lovely, so lovely. Uh, but what is... Right quickly. Uh, do we are there any like what are you up to now like uh, do you have any plans of taking this and then putting it on to do you want it to remain a book or are you open to the idea of maybe this also becoming a series or a film or any such future plans um i have had conversations about uh, actually all four of my books with different uh, people right. so the harold brown series um some there have been a few conversations with someone about turning it into an animation because um it's short and it fits really, it's very visual. So right. people, uh, so the person I'm talking to is kind of convinced that it will work well as an animated uh, film, right. uh, which I'm very excited about. I don't know anything about that. So I would, I would really like to learn, you know, how, how, it, how a book translates into a film. Correct. Um, two series, there have been a few conversations about turning it into um, a film yeah. uh, set in India with like, you know, like uh, the whole cast exactly as they are in the books. It'll be perfect. Um, I can just see it. That would be, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I can visualize it uh, so much in my head. Um, but I'm, I'm, maybe this year we'll like, you know, get to the stage two of these discussions. Right. Um, I would like to turn them into audio books because uh, that, that is something that's been on my list for the longest time. Um, I know. Hey, madam, excuse me. Hello, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The idea started from your the conversation I had with you, honestly. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. And I've been very uh, drawn to that idea. And the thing is, like right now, uh, kids are doing so much online classes. I think, yeah. like, uh, what I'm seeing is parents uh, want their kids to be away from screens and, you know, something that they can listen to while maybe, you know, just lying on their bed and staring out of the window. That, that might, or on a long drive. 
I think audio books work really well, you know, for that. I absolutely um, so agree I'm, with I you. Think, yeah, I think that, um, uh, the next step is uh, audio for the books. Right, lovely. So if right now people want to go and buy, uh, where all is is the book available? How can they get their hands on it? Um, in India, it's available on Amazon, uh, but in print or Kindle version, whichever works, you know, better for your uh, for you for your reading habits. Right. Um, around the world, it's most it's available in uh, in Kindle version, but in the US and UK, it's also in print. So, it, but it's all on Amazon. All four of my books are on Amazon. Right. Um, so you can just pick them up from there. Excellent. So then it's easy to go and buy, and I'm also going to leave the link in the description. So that'll make it really, really easy. all through your process did it ever happen that you know you thought of something and you just couldn't get yourself to write it down like i know <laughs> four books have released but still was there ever a moment when you got stuck you know what they usually call the writers block but it doesn't have to be a full on writers block it could just be that the same flow that you were coming with you were just unable to go ahead with it have you experienced any such thing what did you do to get out of it that that happens so many times shruti during a book writing like i've got used to it now so there's there's a few tricks that you can uh, that i follow like i know these are tried and tested for me um one is i know if i get stuck um it's usually because i'm not able to find the right words or the right way to convey something um right. or i'm not happy with what i've written so I, and there's just an instinct that tells you something is off over here right. and then you have to take a little time out so then usually in those situations i like to go back to the books that i like to read of my favorite authors you know that that kind of inspires you uh, afresh um i like to uh, play like ambient ocean sound sometimes because that helps me sink into the zone um, yeah. a little bit yeah. yeah yeah um or i just go for a run sometimes it clears my head you know you come back and you're you're feeling you know you you feel like you can write again uh, from scratch um that's that but for the zoo series um one of the challenges i faced you know when you're writing something that is autobiographical um it's very interesting to me because it's my life right. and you know it's the people that i love you know, my, my siblings i mean i still think they were the cutest kids i've ever seen and they were the funniest and you know the most gutsy and the most mischievous and what not but someone who's reading uh, a, a new reader who's never met the four of us before or who doesn't know what my life was like or you know who had who doesn't think that you know my siblings were as great as i think they were um <laughs> Because for them you have to it has to be uh, funny for them as well you know you yeah. have to feel like you know the characters or you relate them to your siblings or your your childhood friends um so the, i got stuck a lot there because when you're writing autobiography you have to be able to convert something that is interesting to you and make it interesting to a stranger as well right. um so i i rewrote a lot of the book uh, a lot of the stories many times over and you know things that i assume the reader would know or that, that I, i take for granted in my life a reader may may not uh, know these things about it like a lot of the language in the book um, i'm referring to hindi or marathi terms and so i had to put a like a dictionary at the end where you know like a glossary of terms right. where i say okay you know gulab jamun and i explain what the what a gulab jamun is in english um, because I, by now by, like i know that i get readers from different countries so hindi or marathi is not their you know they're not familiar with it at all Correct. um so i would find myself getting stuck on these issues maybe i shouldn't use hindi words but then the story is set in belgaum where like, we spoke marathi uh, a lot with a lot of our people at home mm. so you know the, the you get stuck in some of these points so then i had to keep coming back to it and looking at it from an outside perspective right. um that that was a problem for me writing the zoo books Right, um, but yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it panned it. out really well by the end of it because <laughs> to be able to take that much of change within self and be open enough to actually bring that change, I think is a very huge deal. Where someone you know would have read and told you, hey, these are the points which you must improve. I mean, it's very yeah. easy to be rigid and say, yeah, no, thank you. I think it's good. I'm good. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 thanks. But yeah, yeah very. That is. Right, it happens. It happens yeah. very. That is that is. Uh, no, I actually the first book, uh, the first Welcome to the Zoo book. I finished the for the draft. I edited it like a thousand times, and when I was finally happy with it, I asked. Uh, I have two or three friends who um, who read a lot, and they don't sugarcoat their feedback at all. And like I usually prefer to get my feedback sugarcoated, but when it comes <laughs> to my writing, um, you know, I want them to be as brutal as possible. Yeah, yeah. So I sent it to them, and I said, just tell me the parts where you don't identify with it, or you think it's too um, mysterious for a strange reader. You know, they won't understand where I'm coming from. 
and uh, they sent back my manuscript with the, the red highlights everywhere and said change this change that change this so uh, i made changes there and then i felt uh, the book was ready to be published so with all your experience what is that one advice that you want to give to anyone who's out there thinking maybe i can be a writer maybe i can write a book or maybe i should what is that one advice to them um don't don't let your inner critic tell you that you are not old enough or experienced enough or as good a writer as you know the greats are um your inner critic is going to be the worst person the most harsh uh, person that you will ever hear there's if you get bad feedback as a writer you know all the time but the the feedback that comes from inside is the most brutal sometimes and that's what stops that's what stopped me for a very long time from writing and thinking about publishing yeah. um if you if you have a story to tell and you feel like a book is the best medium for you you should write it you should put it down um but you should also consider the if you're going to publish it get a reviewer get a professional designer for your cover you know those are the things that make your book um stand out and the quality looks you know when when your book is printed or whether it's online however you decide to publish it um get a professional to do the parts that you are not good at like right. the cover is the most is, is a very important part uh, if you're not confident of the the storyline or the structure or the plot or the grammar uh, get a reviewer to work on it like to send it out because when you put it out there you can't really change it um, you know and yeah. like i go back to my first book all the time and i'm like god oh, i could have done it so differently <laughs> i could have done so many things you know different so once you put it out there it's out there so that, right. that's your legacy so make sure it's as good as you can make it before yeah. you put it out there but don't let that scare you you should go ahead we we need more books in the world always you know you should write a book wow i think that's like that's that's very encouraging for everyone out there who's listening so if you're thinking ha mujhe kahani likhni hai go for it go for it thank you so much for joining me today and sharing such in depth view of things the way you've experienced it and what you you know it's very kind of you to actually come out and talk about it so thank you thank you for being on the podcast today i've had so much fun it's not felt like an interview it's felt like you know two friends sitting over a cup of coffee and chatting that's um, what it and is and i'm i'm always i'm always nervous before an interview because you know like you're you're setting up camera you're going to be the, the talking to the public Yeah. Um, but you made it very easy so thank you for that oh so sweet thank you so much <laughs> i really look forward to the third book of the series thank and you. for all thank the you. amazing things that are coming your way now so yay thank keep you. us in the loop thank, thank you, you so much bye, bye.